Hi, welcome back to Hater TV and part two of the prosecution of George W. Bush for murder. We've concluded that under the law of California, it is possible to indict George W. Bush for the death of a young person who was induced to engage in mortal combat with people who killed him in self-defense. In order to make out the case, the prosecutor would have to prove that the young person was, in fact, induced. Since proof would have to be beyond a reasonable doubt, it would be essential to establish with specificity the exact statements Bush made that caused the young victim to believe that it was necessary to go to Iraq and engage the foe in mortal combat. Testimony from his family concerning the victim's behavior and the precise channel that he was watching would be necessary, and the text of the speech would have to be introduced into evidence. The falsity of the statements in the speech would have to be proven. If Bush testified, his testimony regarding the fact that he believed there were in fact WMDs in Iraq would have to be considered as potentially raising a reasonable doubt as to his wrongful state of mind. What evidence would Bush try to keep out at the trial? Bush would contend two contradictory things. First, that in order to present his defense, he would need to disclose facts concerning what he knew about the presence of weapons of mass destruction. And second, that those facts could not be revealed because it would jeopardize national security. Thus, he would argue that in the interest of keeping the nation safe from terrorist attack, he could not get a fair trial, and thus he could not be tried at all. Of course, if the Department of Defense were friendly to the prosecution, they could waive the national security objection and Bush could have his fair trial. On the other hand, the prosecution could argue that Bush has already admitted in public that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Bush could counter that he was, however, lying when he made those admissions, again for reasons of national security, and since he was not under oath when he said them, he could not be prosecuted for false swearing. As he observed while in office, I don't really testify. Bush would also object if the prosecution sought to introduce evidence of the victim's statements, such as, Mom, I'm going to join the Marines because if we don't fight them over there, we'll have to fight them here. The defendant would no doubt object that these statements were hearsay. This objection could be met with the counter-argument that the statements are offered to show the victim's then-present state of mind, and not the truth of the matter asserted. The objection could then be properly overruled, and the statements would be admi admitted to establish that the false statements of Bush did in fact induce the victim to depart the homeland and engage in mortal combat and lose his life. What would be Bush's best theory of defense? The defense lawyer would focus his case on the defendant's reasonable belief that he was involved in a struggle for the survival of Christian civilization, and even if he were wrong, that his choice to induce the victim to engage in mortal combat was justified as the least of evils. In other words, that if he had not commenced the war in Iraq, the consequences for larger numbers of people would have been graver than the death of merely one young person. The prosecutor would likely object to this type of argument on the grounds that these matters were so collateral that they would likely confuse the jury. The judge would have to rule on this issue before the trial began, and that ruling would control the scope and likely outcome of the case. If the judge ruled for the accused, the trial would become totally unwieldy, because these vast political issues and the calculus of how many lives were lost and how many were saved by the war in Iraq would be entirely speculative. A very good argument could be made that this defense should be overruled because the lives of persons other than the victim are not at issue in a murder trial. However, we can certainly imagine judges disagreeing with the prosecution's argument and finding that such an issue would have to be explored in order to illuminate the motivations of ex-President Bush. Since ultimately his motivation would be the central issue in the case, a judge might insist that however complex the issue might be, the defendant would have a right to present that defense. Could the case actually be tried? This would, in fact, be a very difficult case to prosecute. However, someone may try to do it. Such a person might be a prosecutor who had lost a loved one in Iraq or was closely connected with someone who did. Like all cases, it would depend on the attitude of the judge and the jury. The evidentiary rulings would have to come down almost uniformly on the side of the prosecution and in an ordinary case, a series of pro-prosecution rulings would be nothing unusual. However, in this case, they would be extraordinary. The evidentiary obstacles that would be presented on national security grounds would be enormous. You would also see a parade of prestigious defense witnesses who would attempt to sway the jury to sympathy for the defense. 
Selecting an unbiased jury would be a very time-consuming task. Indeed, one would be hard-pressed to find people not already convinced about the issues. Certainly, it would be difficult to find someone who could answer no to the question, have you heard about the weapons of mass destruction? If you could find that person, you might well doubt whether they had the mental ability to serve on a jury. The only way this case could ever come to trial would be if it were supported by a groundswell of hatred for the defendant, very likely after extensive disclosures through congressional hearings and declassification of evidence that currently is locked under seal and may have already been destroyed. The only way to actually charge the ex-president with murder would be to have laid hold on the ex essential evidence and to have obtained cooperation from many witnesses who currently have no incentive to cooperate. If you can imagine Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, Karl Rove, Alberto Gonzalez, Harriet Myers, and the rest of the inner circle turning state's evidence, then you can imagine this case going to trial. Otherwise, it sounds like the movie Oliver Stone should have made instead of W.